as traditional owners of the land. Um, that's nearly 30,000 people. So it's very, very good news that's come through. My, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. The library is at the heart of American cultural life, as Thomas Schiff tells us in the library book. It's also books, libraries and readers and the collections are central to cultural life around the world as this uh, three day conference tells us. Thomas Jefferson's personal library at Monticello opens Schiff's book. My focus today is on another personal library in the USA belonging to an author who wrote in French. It's a library of 7,000 volumes at the heart of the cultural and creative life of this author, Margaret Yulsena. She was the first woman or first immortelle, as the French call her, which is the French, it's the feminized version of the men, which there'd never been one since 1635. She was the first in 1980. The men are called immortelles, just I W M O R T E L for the masculine. The out, sorry, the outfit, I'm back. The outfit that Margaret Yulsena chose to wear at her induction ceremony um, is a very, very elegant outfit for an older woman looking like a mother superior or an abbess, really, as somebody said. Uh, but it reminds us that she didn't only have a towering intellect. But also, as Joan Howard points out, she was a sensualist, alive to beauty everywhere in the natural world, birds and all creatures she adored, in cultural artifacts and in the aesthetic environment of all her surroundings. She lived in this house. It's this attractive white clapboard house, Petite Plaisance on Mount Desert Island which was uh, L'Ile du Mont Désert when Champlain came there in the 16th century, off the coast of Maine with its charming, organic, pesticide-free garden, um, which uh, was set up by its owners. It was there that Margaret Yulsenau and her companion lived and built up their library from the 1950s when they bought the house until Grace Freak's death on November the 18th, 1979 and on Margaret Yulsena's death on the 17th of December, 1987, a date I always recall. It was a library on which she drew extensively, a library reflecting the evolution of her thinking and helping her realize through meticulous through research detail, detail, the exactitude of her fictional, fictional characters, whatever historical period they're situated in. Collections built around different subjects. There are um, 7,000 volumes, as I said, or different historical periods in all the rooms and in every available space in the house, two of which I've chosen to show you. Margaret Yulsenau's bedroom with her dog on the bed, her last dog, Fuku, happiness on her bed. Um, this houses 20th century works. And the next bit I'll show you, this is the hallway with 17th century works. I draw on one of these in this talk. Assisted by Grace Frick as collaborator, companion, and translator into English, Yulsenau wrote here the majority of the works which brought her enormous fame. Novels and novella, short stories, poetries, plays, essays, family chronicles, translations into French from Greek, English, and Japanese, all constitutes a richly diverse oeuvre. Of the many historical periods and diverse subjects Yulsenau's fiction and non-fiction deal with, I shall discuss one from the beginning of her career and the other from the end, drawing attention to the importance of the Petite Plaisance Library in the creation of these works. In the former case, text from the ancient past, in the latter, text from the 17th and 19th centuries. What Yulsenau said when she was speaking of one of her male protagonists was l'une des meilleures manières de recréer la pensée d'un homme, reconstituer sa bibliothèque. One of the best ways of recreating the thinking or the thought of a man, and it applies to anyone, is reconstituting his library. This is a statement which holds true of herself as well. This tool, Bibliothèque de Marguerite Ursena, is an absolutely indispensable tool. 
considering the importance of the library at Petit Plaisance. Yvonne Bernier's meticulously set out very easy to consult inventory. Yulsenau's earliest subject of predilection uh, in her reading, her writing, and her very extensive travel, she's a veteran traveler, was classical antiquity, very much the preoccupation of the Europe of the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries, if we look at the work of Gide and countless other writers around at the time. The allure of that untraveled world that Tennyson speaks of in this quote I've got here appealed enormously to her and alert to the injunction of the great Alexandrian poet Gavafi, whom as we see, she translated into French from the Greek. She went through that arch time and time again, setting out en route for a meta meta uh, sorry, metaphorical Ithaca. Gavafi's wish here, uh, when he says, when you leave for Ithaca, hope or wish that the, that the path be a long one, rich in peripeties and in experience. So his wish here, that when one sets out for Ithaca, the route is a long one and rich in experience and peripeties, is fulfilled time and time again for Marguerite Yulsana, whose writing was greatly enriched by these travels. This um, preoccupation with classical antiquity led to her first great international success, to her very great surprise. She always said she thought she might get three readers. Um, this is one of the many works translated into over 50 languages, as all, all her work is. Um, and it's never been, it won't go out of print, I don't think, for a long time either. Um, Memoir d'Adria, published in 1951, is a recreation in epistolary form, in letter form, of the life of the Roman emperor Hadrian, who reigned from 117 to 138 of the Common Era. To write these imaginary memoirs, which Yulsen has spent a, long, spent a long time writing and thinking about. She drew on a vast array of numismatics of coins, architectural, archaeological, and literary material, including the poem was, that Hadrian was believed to have written on his deathbed, a playful elegiac address to his soul, animula vagula blandula, little sweet little soul, about to give up the pleasurable gains of life enjoyed on earth. In, of prime importance in creating these memoirs, evidence of what the organisers of this conference aptly call, and I love it, engagement with the textual, textual artefacts of the past, Yulsenar's use of the Periplus, as it is known, originally written in Greek, um, which she has in a, a French translation in her library. Uh, it was a, a report written in the form of a letter to the emperor by Hadrian's right-hand man and great friend, the Bithynian Arian, governor of Cappadocia, a very learned man, a, a, obviously a very charming man, on the circumnav circumnavigation of the Black Sea, carried out at Hadrian's behest. In her reflections on the composition, this is the Black Sea, a very much an interior sea and very hard to get to, sometimes on the left of the, of the map here, you have to go across the mountains to get to it, but it's a very rich in, in culture. Uh, Yulsena wrote in her reflections on the composition of these imaginary memoirs, she acknowledged in them her debt to Arian, particularly his lyrical description of a temple to Achilles on this island in the Black Sea, Lurcus in Greek and Alba in Latin. She said, if all other documents were lacking, the letter of Arian to the Emperor Hadrian on the circumnavigation of the Black Sea would suffice to recreate in broad outline that great imperial figure. Everything is there, the nostalgia for ancient Greece and its ideals, discreet allusion to a lost love. That was the young man who died, Antinous, the companion of Hadrian, and to mystical consolation sought by the bereaved survivor the haunting appeal of unknown lands and barbarous climes, the evocation of desert wastes peopled only by seabirds, so profoundly romantic in spirit, calls to mind the exquisite vase, vase found in Hadrian's villa to be seen today in the museum of the Thelma in Rome. There on a field of marble snow, a flock of wild heron are spreading their wings to fly away in utter solitude. 
The appearance of birds in this early 1951 work, a personal predilection, Margaret, Margaret Yules and I shared with Grace Frick from their earliest meeting, and a personal one of mine, I might add, is intensified in her subsequent fictional and non-fictional writings. In her final work of adult fiction, An Homme Obscure, An Obscure Man, set in 17th century Holland, birds play a vital role at the end of the life of the protagonist, Nathanael, as he's called, Nathaniel. Not long before he dies, alone on a Frisian island, he muses on the thousands of birds nesting or flying overhead on the isolated island where he's living and about to die. You've reached 10 minutes now, Adrian. Nathaniel is a largely uneducated and simple man, imbued, however, with great sensitivity and empathy for the um, natural world, for the creatures that share the earth with him, for the very trees around him. The evolution of Yulsunar's thinking about the natural world, nourished by her reading and her exploration with her companion of areas of wilderness in North America, leads smoothly and inevitably to this depiction of a man completely in tune with the world around him and every man for all of us. His sensitivity is echoed in his creator's commitment to the planet in all life forms, disciplines associated with its preservation and the universe in which it sits. This is clearly evidenced by the works of her library in the dining room collection and in one of the guest bedrooms on a vast array of subjects, natural history, evolution, insects, marine life, birds, environmental protection and nature conservancy, forest, astronomy, geology, only some of them. Notable You've reached 10 minutes now, Jane. Thank you. Notable among the books in this part of the collection, Rachel Carson's The Sea Around Us and Silent Spring. Uh, sea Around Us 51, 1951 and Silent Spring 1962, which had a profound influence on her as they have on a lot of us. As the critic Berengère Dupré points out, other works in the library include oh, Henry, sorry, I've got to say it in French, Henry David Thoreau's In Wildness is the Preservation of the World, Walden and the Maine Woods. These are all fundamental to Yulsenar's vision. A particularly important size, source for this novel as, as, novella, sorry, as I've found, is Spinoza's complete works in a French translation housed in the 17th century collection in the hallway. It's his doctrine of canatus or self-realization for all creatures, which is central to an obscure man. All creatures, whether human, animal or vegetable, are linked for him, for the protagonist, Nathanael, in the common cause which governs their existence, all face the difficulties of living and dying. These concerns are echoed in a large number of animal and human rights, as well as environmental, let me see where we're up to, uh, where we, um, organizations to which Yulsenar belonged. Her correspondence too, some 3,000 letters, all the originals are kept at Harvard in the Houghton Library, uh, along with the, um, all of her manuscripts. Uh, these underline, uh, her, this correspondence underlines these concerns of hers. A word, uh, sorry, a work linked to an opera obscure published posthumously with the title La Voix des Choses, and it's up here, um, further reveals the way her, th her thought was evolving. The title refers to a stone given to her in a hospital by her friend Jerry Wilson, which fell and smashed, emitting a beautiful ringing sound. The voice of things, Yosana said. It's a collection of Christian, Buddhist and other sayings, the bedside reading that sustained her throughout her life. This connects her to Thoreau, for whom, as Béranger de Pré points out, Buddhism was important. The two writers shared a common spiritual heritage. This beautiful Buddhist quote, which I'll throw up and say in French for you. Si innombrable que soient les créatures errantes dans l'étendue de, des trois mondes, je travaillerai à les sauver. However numerous the creatures wandering in the reaches of the creatures, sorry, wandering in the reaches of the three worlds, so that's earth, sky, and ocean, I'll work to save them. So it's a very beautiful quote. Photos taken by Jerry Wilson recall passages in an on obscure, an obscure man. The beautiful migration of swans, which you get in also the work I've just mentioned, an obscure man. Flamingos and a blue heron, beautiful photo of a blue heron, slightly put it a bit on, a bit crookedly, but a blue heron taking off in flight on Texel Island in Holland, 
recalling the blue heron glimpsed on a walk along the rocky coast of Mount Desert Island, not long before Grace Frick, her companion's death, and mentioned in a letter Fiels and I wrote to her proofreader in Paris, Jeanne Carayon. And Yulsenar's legacy. The value of the Petite Plaisance Library, which as part of the whole property can be visited, and I'll show you here. Um, there's also a virtual tour you can do. Um, uh, is summed up in the assessment of a library's function by Alberto Mangle. You, some of you might have read his History of Reading, which is a magnificent book. He was also a uh, translator of Margaret Yulsenar. Libraries are, he tells us, the custodians of the written word the memory, the voice, and the face of the society that houses the written word, teaching us what books can do, showing us our responsibilities towards one another, helping us question our values, undermining our prejudices, lending us courage and ingenuity to live together, and giving us illuminating words that might allow us to imagine better times. In short, I had a better future for the world. It's a very likely a very beautiful Anne Lamott that our previous speakers also, um, that quote, beautiful. And Yosna's writings, um, a very vital, it's a vital force in perpetuating the legacy, uh, the legacy of this extraordinary writer is a very active society, which has been going a long time, since just after 1987, devoted to Margaret Yosna, founded just after her death by, by Rémi Poignot. So it's a repository of her works and organizes a lot of conferences around the world and assists with organizing, publishes extensively on her, on Margaret Yosena, and has an annual journal, or Vita, as it's called, and also publishes the proceedings of the conferences on the author. Margaret Yosena's life in North America, to sum up, her reading revealed by the impressive collection of Petit Plaisance her involvement in the natural world with frequent exploration of areas of wilderness, her espousal of organizations defending animal and human rights, as well as ecological issues, and her impassioned correspondence on all these issues form a unified and co coherent whole, what I call an ecosophie, which finds expression in her fictional and non-fictional writing all the writings of this transnational writer, as David Damrosch calls her, linking her to T.S. Eliot and others, translated into more than 50 languages, can be seen as allowing us to reevaluate our position on the planet. The way she lived her life and the works of this author, one of the most important internationally recognized authors of the 20th century, should ensure Margaret Yorsena a place not only as a great writer, in every conceivable literary form, but also as an important figure in the ecology and animal and human rights movements of the 20th century. If we can check climate change and a subject on which Margaret Yorsena would have had a great deal to say, the book and the future of the world are in safe hands with her legacy. This very issue is one which her books may help us to solve. Her library and her books give us hope. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Thank you for your attention.